Thank you. And we now move on to the next session, uh, which is by Dr. Pradeep Joshi. Uh, Dr. Pradeep Joshi is traveling. He is in Udaipur, which unfortunately today has um, an internet lockdown. So we have uh, managed to have his uh, recorded video and uh, uh, a brief introduction. He is a national professor, uh, professional officer and CD of uh, WHO country office for India with over 15 years experience. And he is providing technical assistance to various state governments for strengthening the national NCD program and has been engaged in frame of national multi-sectoral action plan for NCDs. Manish, can I have the video, please? Namaste and good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Pradeep Joshi from WHO Country Office for India. And uh, first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Daksham Health and Education, the Indian Stroke Association, and the Stroke Support Alliance for organizing this much needed consultation on the eve of the World Stroke Day. Friends, I have been given responsibility to talk about patient voice in the policy based on the learning from the WHO Diabetes Compact. And I have structured my presentation in uh, three sections. One talk, first talking about the association of diabetes and the stroke. The second about what is the WHO Global Diabetes Compact. And the last about how we can do the meaningful engagement of patient living with the diabetes. Friends, uh, we are all aware that there are estimated 77 million people suffering from the diabetes. And to add further, there are 25 million people who are pre-diabetic, which will convert into the frank diabetic in the future. A worrisome problem is that more than 50% of these individuals are unaware of their diabetic state status. It is well evident that diabetes is independent, but a modifiable risk factor for stroke. And the risk of the stroke is two to three times higher uh, in the patient uh, who are suffering from the diabetes. And the risk goes further higher if you have, if the patient have comorbidities like obesity and hypertension. The good part is that having proper glycemic control and healthy lifestyle can reduce the incidence of the stroke among the diabetic patients. ICMR in 2017-18 conducted the survey on NCD risk factor survey and based on that it has been identified that around 49% of the urban population or and 27.2% of the rural population are on the diabetic medication. And if we talk about the control rate which uh, determines the outcome of the diseases or the stroke or the incidence is only 19% in urban area and 13.5% in the rural area, which indirectly denotes that either the patients are not taking drugs properly or they have issues related to accessibility or availability of the diabetic medication. If we talk about the availability of essential medicines at the primary healthcare level, the availability of metformin and insulin both in urban and rural area is around 21%. The availability of at least one glucometer or glucose strip or urine strips is around 52% to 47% in urban and rural public health facilities. About the health seeking behavior, uh, most of the patients are going or taking seeking treatment from the private sector and even in the public sector, the allopathic practitioner consultation ranges around 22% in the uh, urban area and 19% in the rural area. WHO has launched the Global Diabetes Compact uh, coinciding with the 100th anniversary of the discovery of the insulin and recognizing that still majority of the patient don't have access to the insulin. And this was launched in the 2021 with a vision to reduce the risk of the diabetes and those patients who are suffering from the diabetes have equitable, affordable, accessible and quality diabetic treatment and care. There are eight areas in the global diabetes compact 
but I will be focusing primarily on the five which have uh, a close relation with the patient living with the NCDs, uh, the, with the diabetes. The first is about talking about collaboration and multi-stakeholder approach involving the patient living with the diabetes also in defining the agenda for prevention control of diabetes. The second is taking steps for diabetes prevention and management and integrating into the primary healthcare as well as the universal healthcare agenda to reduce the financial hardship. The third one is about improving, improving access to the treatment, especially about the diabetes diagnostics, medicines, and healthy products, especially the insulin one. The patient living with the in the humanitarian emergencies also faces the hardship. So there is need to improve diabetic care and allocations of educated resources and funds over there. The fifth one is improving understanding of the diabetes among patients living with the diabetes. And the other three components of the global diabetes component uh, compact is uh, talks about the innovation, about the setting up the targets for the diabetes. And the last one, building uh, back better from the COVID-19 emergencies. Friends, before developing this WHO Global Diabetes Compact, there was an informal consultative process was done patient living with the diabetes, considering their importance in policy making process and their ability to convey their lived experience in the policy making and in the engagement process. The outcome of the consultation where 140 participants from 37 countries have participated was that meaningful engagement should act as a guiding principle for a high level decision making process. And there is a need for building an engagement framework to support the transition, the voice or the stories of the patients into the partnership, into the advocacy and implementation part. The, the outcome was also defined, the outcome also defined that the patient living with the diabetes must be valued as experts and agents for the change. And there is a need to improve access to the education, social support, and the global price tag for having equity in the cost of insulin and other medication related to the diabetes. There should be proper representation in terms of diversity, ethnicity, gender and intersectionality. Patients should not be considered as a virtue and the policy should convert from patient-centered care to the people-centered care. And all this require comprehensive landscape review, what have been done in other countries to share with uh, uh, the, the other countries and conducting those research to further improve the meaningful engagement for the NCDs. Based on this consultative pro process, a document has been devised, which is nothing for us without us and focuses on the domains for the meaningful engagement of the NCDs. In the one domain about the governments, governance, uh, uh, we all know the UN high level political declaration for NCDs have focused on bringing the patient living with the NCDs in the decision making table and involving them for co-creating solutions and through the participatory approach and also creating an enabling and protective environment for patients living with the NCDs. The collaboration and partnership is required to have improved access to the treatment and the opportunities uh, because these are considered as barriers uh, for the patient living with the NCDs and bringing their successful models of engagement or uh, developing the right tools and resources to influence the community and the group of people uh, about the diabetes management and care. The patient living with the diabetes also have important role in the implementation of the program. The proper stakeholder mapping need to be done and lessons learned from the other national program can further enhance uh, their role in the implementation of the program. We all know about a huge gap about the understanding of the diabetes among patients living with uh, diabetes. So that needs to be improved about how the prevent 
prescription and the treatment uh, can be done for the diabetes and their need of a proper consultations to bring together the diverse voices so no one left is left behind. Friends, we have to uh, leverage on the existing policies and program environment and Healthy India Alliance has come up with the India advocacy agenda uh, of people living with the NCDs which talk about how to meaningfully engage the uh, patients living with the NCDs and even the comprehensive primary health care through health and wellness centers of Aishman Bharat speaks about the engagement of patient in the uh, improving the care and the prevention part. There is also opportunity to learn from the other programs, especially HIV, tobacco. Tobacco, we know voices of the victims, how it has influenced the tobacco control program and the policy making process at the different level, whether it is governance at the, at the government level, at the media level, at the judiciary level. There are other programs where there are practices of involving patients in the decision-making process like TB, malaria, and maternal child health. Friends, I will end my talk with a quote from my DG, Dr. Tedros, which says, WHO values the voices of patient living with diabetes, their expertise and inputs, and WHO is committed to leverage its role in supporting member states in doing the same. Uh, thank you for patiently listening to uh, me and uh, I'm happy to answer the queries. If the time doesn't allow, please reach out to the organizer and I will uh, try to reply as much of your queries. Thank you and Namaste. Thank you, Dr. Joshi, for that lovely message. Nothing without us for us or nothing about us without us. Um, and that truly embodies the message where patients have to be involved in every aspect of uh, the journey, whether it is a treatment, the rehabilitation, policy making, access to treatment, clinical trials, the entire spectrum. And that brings us to the next part of our uh, um, panel, which is the second panel that will look at uh, socioeconomic and psychological aspects of stroke, an area that is often neglected and not much talked about, especially, especially because the health sector does not look at psychosocial rehabilitation. It's the Ministry of Social Justice that does. And usually these two ministries don't talk to each other. So, uh, so bringing together the whole panel is the chair, uh, Dr. Madhuri Bihari. Um, she needs no introduction. She is an icon and a stalwart. Everybody uh, in the neurology um, area knows her very well, but it is my honor to introduce her. She is the current director of neurology at Rajendhal Fortis Hospital, Vasant Kunj. Um, she's also the ex-professor and HOD Ames, New Delhi, and a visiting professor at BP Korala Institute of Health Sciences, Dharan, Nepal, and Massachusetts General Hospital, Boston. She has several honors, awards, recognitions. The list is very, very long. And she has over 370 peer reviewed scientific papers, 30 book chapters, and she has written six books. Um, she has several fellowships and memberships. Um, that in itself tells us about the wealth of knowledge and experience that she will bring to the panel. Over to you, Madhuri, ma'am. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ratma, for this kind words. Uh, it is my privilege to be invited for this uh, meeting for the lay people and the survivors of stroke. And as we know, uh, that this meeting is certainly very different from the ones we have uh, had earlier in the past on stroke. This is basically for the people of uh, survivors of stroke and with the mind to look after them and what we can do in future. And this is not so much academic as most of the other meetings are. And in this, uh, in which only doctors and neurologists used to take part. But in this, we have people from all walks of life who look after the patients of Parkinson's, including uh, physiotherapists, physiatrists. And I think we should also need to have people who take care of speech therapy, language therapy, and psychologists and psychiatrists all should be there involved in this because the patients a person who gets a stroke once in one's lifetime has so many issues in his life, whether I'll be, go back, be able to go back to my work, 
what will happen to my family my children will how will they look after themselves all those things are there and that makes the person very anxious and depressed so we have to look after that all those aspects so in this uh, i'm very happy and delighted that dr ratna has taken care to in include this part of the session also in this meeting uh, and i'm i'm really obliged to dr ratna dakshayam and the forum for patients uh, stroke support alliance of india with this uh, these words i will want to uh, invite all the members of the panel and our first speaker is professor sunil narayan who is a senior professor in the department of neurology at jawaharlal institute of post graduate medical education and research pondicherry he is also the founder program he also runs several programs in education like dm neurology bsc and msc in technology and also post doctoral fellowship in uh, stroke medicine also phd he has several qualifications like dm dnb and others from uk like frcp he is also an frcp also he is area of interest are stroke autism spectral eeg neurobiology and neuro rehabilitation and modulation he has several publications and uh, total grant of more than 1.5 crores to under, uh, undertake several research projects he is organizing secretary of tropical yeah, uh, neurology i am very much here so can i now request dr sunil narayan to please take over and give his talk dr sunil narayan please yeah uh, uh, thank you very much madam for that uh, very kind uh, uh, introduction and i thank uh, uh, dr ratna and the entire health alliance group for giving me this uh, opportunity i have uh, once again encountered a, a issue with the uh, uh, getting on my uh, getting my video on uh, i am clicking on it but it's just refusing to start the video so i don't know what exactly is the problem uh, so for the time being i think uh, uh, i remain hidden <laughs> but that's not voluntary uh, there is an issue i'm just uh, clicking on the start video but it's not uh, uh switching me on uh so uh if anyone can uh, uh help me with this i'll be grateful but otherwise i don't want to waste time and uh, i'll be happy to go it uh, is that okay so you can join it again uh do you want me to uh, log out and try again yes sir uh all right Doctor, uh, so Doctor do you want uh, somebody else to fill that uh, Yeah, Dr. Hari, you can take the next. All right. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. And this is Dr. Dharam Pandey. He is a senior consultant and head head of the Department of Physiotherapy Department and Rehabilitation Department at BCMHCT Manipal Hospital at Dwarka, Delhi. he is associate professor of department of physiotherapy institute of applied medicine and research at ghaziabad he is also consultant physiotherapist and rehabilitation at blk super specialty hospital a research associate of indian journal of physiotherapy and occupational therapy he has several other uh, awards several which will take a lot of time to complete this and his significant contributions are aims new access in 2013 clinical excellence award in 2015 and best clinician award in 2018 at jamia milia ismailia college university so dr pandey please you are there thank you ma'am for kind introduction and uh, thanks to sports alliance and uh, indian stroke association for organizing such a wonderful uh, uh panel discussion as uh, uh, dr bihari ma'am said yes, that ma uh, this is the unique uh, topic we have uh, i would put my uh, views on uh, three uh, headings uh, the earlier speaker also i was listening to that they were uh, focusing on the awareness and uh, 
uh, other things like how where we are lacking in uh, stroke rehabilitation part and and overall stroke care in india so the first thing i would emphasize that about the awareness that you all uh, agree with me uh, that the rural population as we are talking about the my topic is the rural and urban gap is what gap is uh, there in rehabilitation uh, perspective of a stroke so uh, with context to that the, you all agree with me that rural population is uh, uh, not even aware about the, the term stroke forget about stroke rehabilitation post stroke rehabilitation so at the community uh, level rehabilitation uh, education and uh, in fact overall is stroke about is stroke uh, has to take place and uh, these population must be uh, made aware out of uh, stroke prevention treatment and uh, rehabilitation and uh, basically changing their mindset that uh, most of you must have heard that once the stroke is uh, uh, happened and uh, the people run here and there after discharge even though they get a very good care uh, in st acute stroke and they are managed to survive then after they there's some kabutar ka khoon and them some jhat phook and all that they get lost actually uh, where to go after acute care so that's the very important uh, uh, point that uh, we should have an awareness programs like uh, earlier the speaker was uh, talking about awareness program and um, some ayushman bharat and all that programs has to be taken care uh, and promoted at the uh, community level and the second uh, things i would emphasize that the cost of rehabilitation the the, the most of an advanced resources particularly advanced technology which is related to uh, rehabilitation are very much limited to urban areas nowadays and because it it is so because uh, most of these technologies are um, very expensive to set up and uh, everywhere it can't be afforded to establish in a rural area or uh, smaller centers so why why it is so because we we need to import those equipments and those technology to india so it becomes so costly and everywhere it is not uh, uh, present so there are very much limitation in that as well that advanced uh, rehabilitation facilities are uh, lacking in our country so so i would suggest that the most of technologists in india and uh, they should move forward towards the make in india program and they should uh they start developing the cost effective technologies uh, re related to stroke rehabilitation in 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 in, in india so that could uh, in that way we can take care of uh, uh, this problem and the third important thing i would uh, focus and i would mention here on this platform that uh, and the policy maker and the government and the, they should start thinking about uh developing uh, and and generating the workforce rehabilitation workforce in india uh, we have a very limited competent workforce in uh, related to rehabilitation in india when uh, i say competency uh, that means professionals yes of course we have physicists we have uh, physiotherapists speech therapists and all that but uh, it, it, it it is not that uh that they are well uh, um, aware and they are very expert and competent in stroke particularly in stroke they might be in uh, expert in neurology or neurosciences but not in a particular stroke that like earlier speaker was a very eminent speaker and uh, uh he is specialized in stroke medicine so why not we have uh, something like uh, stroke rehabilitation as well so that that has to be focused and uh, like 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 uh, most of people think that it is not that uh, once a stroke has happened that one side of paralyzed a stroke is it is lot more it it affects whole family it affects uh, uh, the mental uh, the well being it's uh, and uh, most of people it's in rural area i was going through some of uh, article uh, that the most of uh, rural area patients are suffering from depression post stroke depression but uh they are not even diagnosed for that and even they are not aware about uh, the clinician is not aware about that that the person is going uh, around with the uh, post stroke depression so all these things uh, need to be taken care so 
uh, we need to have focus on these uh, particular area like uh, uh, creating awareness about stroke prevention treatment and rehabilitation uh, particularly in rural area which is very much lacking and developing and um, make in india most cost effective uh, rehabilitation technology which we can build up uh, there are a lot of good institute iit and other they are working but still we need to have focus to develop uh, uh, most advanced technology in india uh, as well we need not to import those so it becomes so um, uh, costly and the third last is the workforce we need to work on developing stroke rehabilitation and stroke medicine specific task uh, workforce in india so these are my few points ma'am uh, that these we need to work on thank you very much dr pandey now i can again ask dr sunil narayan if he is ready with his talk can he just come in yeah i am fine i am actually on the uh, already here okay yes uh, on the net um uh, yeah i think uh, so uh, thank you for uh, uh, patience and i sorted out uh, thank uh, tamanna for giving me the opportunity to again uh, rejoin but i found out that uh, I, i'll just start with uh, giving you a all tip i had switched on my webcam of my uh, laptop to see uh, whether everything is fine and then i forgot to switch off the webcam that's the only reason why it was not connecting so uh, please make sure that if you have a video problem make sure your uh, webcam testing is switched off and as soon as i did that i got connected thank you and uh, to now uh, i mean I, uh, this uh, in this forum I, uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, emphasis uh, on uh, our sharing of our uh, experience and knowledge on stroke uh with uh, the uh public and uh, public at large as well as the stroke caretakers and then uh, stroke patients and uh, stroke uh, physicians as well uh, uh that way uh i don't uh, i'm a little uh, uh, feel a bit constrained talking on a subject research for stroke uh but nevertheless uh, i think uh, it has a lot of relevance uh which i will try to convince you uh and uh, let me uh, start by thanking uh, the uh the uh, health alliance india uh, dr ratna uh and uh, uh madam uh, dr madhuri bihari for uh, uh giving me uh, this uh, uh opportunity to uh, uh to join you on this uh, very important day uh, to share some of my views uh on um uh stroke uh <coughs> now uh see the the uh, topic uh, research for stroke uh is uh, probably uh, included by the uh learned uh, think tank of health alliance uh, because uh, they have certainly felt that uh, there are many areas of stroke where we do have uh, a lot of dark zones Uh, of uh, knowledge uh, we are not sure of things and uh, so uh, though we do have some quite a good amount of information on various aspects of stroke and we are and we are very clear about certain areas and we do have sufficient knowledge in uh, many areas there are indeed uh, always and and always there will be indeed uh, areas where we still want to improve or we still remain ignorant and which is good because only if that's the case uh, we will be able to uh, uh, continue to do better care for our uh, patients and will be able to better take care of our own health uh, can we go to the next slide please right so uh, let me start with the uh, 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 first uh, question um usually when we talk to people about uh, stroke many people uh, even uh, many learned people have some confusion whether it is a disease of the uh, brain or the heart uh this may look a bit funny but uh, even among educated people this confusion i have uh, seen and uh, but there is some uh, there is some relevance also uh, both are diseases of 
uh, blood some uh, diseases to do with the, the blood supply of vital organs. Uh, now, coming to the science of it, uh, is there any, uh, if, if you are taking care of your heart very well by taking care of your blood vessels supplying your heart, are you sufficiently taking care of your brain as well? Are you protecting yourself from stroke as well? Uh, well, this may look uh, uh, very logical to say yes, but we do see in our own practice that there are a lot of people with a very severe coronary disease and all, but uh, they remain quite good uh, uh, intellectually and somehow the brain is protected. But we also see people with uh, strokes who doesn't seem to be uh, always having coronary disease. So um, are they very uh, similar or there are some uh, differences? So we all know that uh, reducing cholesterol level, especially the LDL levels, is quite good for coronary artery diseases. But uh, so uh, statins are, uh, uh, well, there is some controversy which has come up now, but generally we uh, do feel that statins are quite good for uh, reducing cholesterol and maintaining the health of uh, the coronary arteries. But when it comes to brain, there are some uh, issues. Uh, you know that there are uh, several studies like Sparkle and all which have shown that lowering cholesterol too much uh, can sometimes be disposed to bleeds in the brain. And also uh, there could be uh, the, the myelin, which is the insulations of the Uh, connecting uh, tracks between the nerve cells and the, uh, nerve, and the uh, neuronal pools uh, also need a lot of fat. So uh, the uh, aggressive cholesterol rolling may not be all that good for brain as much as it is for heart. So uh, what are the differences? If you look at it, uh, again, there are plenty of studies. Homocysteine is an area where I did my own PhD work. And one thing which was becoming more and more clear, even from if you look carefully at published data on homocysteine from anywhere in the world as well as from India, that uh, uh, high homocysteine is actually uh, certainly far more bad for brain than for uh, the coronary arteries. Uh, so there is, after all, some uh, good in uh, uh, giving uh, the homocysteine uh, lowering uh, vitamins like B12, folic acid, which we neurologists keep on prescribing, uh, and cardiologists do it much less often. There is uh, some uh, uh, scientific justice uh, uh, in that, uh, though B12, all these B vitamins were usually given thinking that it's better for the neuronal health. Uh, there are also uh, many other differences, genetic differences also between the blood vessels of the brain and heart. And this is a very uh, aggressive uh, area of research now. And I'm sure that we are going to get uh, uh, more and more information in time to come. Uh, next one. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the slides I can see in my... Uh, uh, presentation quite well, but uh, are you all able to see the slides clearly, the, uh, the letters and words? No. Are you able to see them uh, clearly on your screen? No, no. Uh, can somebody do anything? This is a, a PowerPoint slide, which is very clean and clear, in uh, which I am having. Uh, but uh, here I do see it, uh, the letters are quite uh, uh, unclear. Uh, so is there a way I can present from here and to try that or shall we go ahead? Okay, I will, uh, uh, because the I am not seeing these uh, slides which are coming in front of me uh, quite readable. The okay. Words. Right, okay. Uh, so the uh, other uh, important uh, question uh, is, uh, what is the uh, 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 best minimum dose for a very common but very important drug uh, like aspirin? Post-stroke, is it? Uh, we have studies on 325 milligram, 300 milligram, 150 milligram, 75 milligram, and the mini pill, 50 milligram. There are uh, advocates of uh, 50 milligram, but even now, even uh, recently, in acute stroke, at least the uh, immediate uh, ischemic stroke, uh, uh, in, in, uh, the, the drug, uh, the dose which you have to give it is a slightly higher dose, 325, 150. 
etc. So the problem here is uh, the a concept called aspirin resistance, which is very, very, very difficult to actually quantitate and to even confirm in a person because biochemically it's a, uh, it's a very uh, challenging area. We ourselves try to uh, do this and we found out that there are a lot of technical questions and technical problems. Uh, so the ideal and uh, the, uh, the minimum dose, we don't want to give too much of aspirin and uh, prod the, uh, the, uh, the uh, internal linings of our stomach and intestinal tracts. Uh, so, uh, but at the same time, it should be good enough to prevent uh, platelet aggregation. Uh, so what's the uh, ideal dose? Uh, this is a question. And even uh, somebody gets a, uh, uh, and again, to compound, we get a stroke after while are on aspirin. So should we give a increase the dose? Or should we add on another antiplatelet drugs like clopidogrel? Or uh, there are other ones like dipyridamol and uh, astomisole and all. Should we try these things? Uh, actually, despite uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, research going on and uh, our full faith that aspirin is good, it prevents uh, platelet aggregation. It's, we still do not know what is the best drug. It, it should, be, should it be individualized? Is there a way to individualize? I'm sure there must be the personalized medicine is coming up in a big way. And we must be able to find out whether uh, will aspirin do good to an individual? You saw it, what best dosage in primary prevention? Does it have a role? Or whether... And when you are giving it as a uh, secondary profile X after somebody has had a stroke, uh, what dose should we give uh, and how long we should uh, give it at that initial, perhaps higher dose, and then what is the maintenance dose? So uh, these are areas which uh, we still need uh, uh, to ask questions. And uh, suppose you're thinking of a drug like clopidogrel. Again, there are problems. I, 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 I hope many of you know that around 30% of the Asian has CYP2, C9, and CYP2, uh, uh, C19 mutations. Uh, we have, these are studies from even from JIPMER, and we have many other reports. There are a uniformity of uh, results telling that around uh, one third of the population are actually uh, the uh, cannot actually metabolize clopidogrel to its uh, uh, active ingredients. So it doesn't work. Then why are we uh, giving clopidogrel without even checking that? Uh, so uh, again, so uh, ideally we should uh, have a certain, uh, and these polymorphisms are not at all unusual around, uh, uh, again, around uh, 20 to 40 percent of the populations can have this uh, polymorphism. So uh, it's important that we check for it if you want to give a drug like clopidogrel, which has got, you know, that there are some problems with blood counts, etc., and people develop anorexia and uh, certain uh, several issues with clopidogrel. Uh, so we had uh, so, and it, this will also encourage for not stopping just with the clopidogrel, just because we had a few trials like chance, etc. But we should continue to look for better drugs. Uh, there are drugs like astimisole, and um, uh, so we, we had to continue to look. And the newer drugs like uh, abseximab, which we are scared because we think that it's, it's a bit too dangerous unless you have a stent, etc. On you, so we have to continue to look for better antiplatelet drugs and the uh, best dose and to who all we can give. Some kind of personalized medicine may be needed here. Next one. Yeah. Uh, so again, uh, anticoagulants, uh, stroke patients with, with a cardioembolic stroke, uh, classically the people with the atrial fibrillation are put on uh, anticoagulation to prevent uh, 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 second stroke. Dr. Suni, I'm are... sorry to interrupt you. We are running late. So I oh. would like you to, uh, you know, shorten your talk a bit if you can. All right. Okay. So I'll, I'll go faster. Uh, so this is uh, another area and uh, we have a problem of rheumatic valvular heart diseases and uh, the uh, ideal drug uh, dosages for rheumatic valvular heart disease, uh, whether when a lot of new anti- arrhythmic drugs, uh, sorry, uh, new anticoagulants came uh, uh, like um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, factor 10 inhibitors, uh, dabigatran and uh, uh, avaroxaban and uh, uh, a, a large number of these uh, drugs are available in market and they are produce less of bleeding and they are less uh, uh, renal and uh, hepatotoxic. But 
uh, are they good for the commonest cause of atrial fibrillation in India? That is rheumatic heart disease, rheumatic valvular heart disease. We still don't have evidence and uh, developing countries where rheumatic heart disease is common have to pursue this. There is an attempt from uh, ICMR uh, based studies on this, but uh, uh, for some reason it is not have taken off. Next one. Oh, right. Um, and we all know that in the large middle cell blood artery infarct, decompression helps. And uh, uh, it previously thought it only saves lives, but we know that in the long term outcome is also help. But uh, do we have the same advantages if we do the decompression for the uh, posterior fossa? Does it also help in a long term uh, pro uh, prognosis? We still do not know that. Next one. Uh, suppose somebody has got a uh, very critical carotid stenosis, more than 80%, uh, usually, and if they had a minor stroke on the same territory, uh, we have to either stent or we have to do the carotid enterotectomy. That is the uh, uh, current, uh, the NACET and ECST studies have very clearly proven this. But what if the infarct is on the opposite side? Or the uh, suppose the patient has had a large infarct, does it always mean that we should never do any, anything more on that uh, tight carotid artery? So we have to actually study the hemodynamics. We, we have tools now. And, and uh, uh, so many of these indications for carotid endotectomy are going to be rewritten in time to come with better uh, information on the hemodynamic status, better, electrophysi uh, be better vascular physiology uh, and uh, rheology information. So uh, this is something which is going to change uh, uh, sooner rather than later. Next one. Um, in major artery uh, uh, stem block, again, uh, we usually, uh, mechanical thrombectomy is actually the uh, preferred treatment uh, because uh, very uh, uh, if it thrombolyzes, it can turn hemorrhagic. And, but at the same time, people think that if the center is too far away, uh, can we actually do a bridging thrombolysis and then shift? Or should we directly shift so that we save the time of thrombolysis and then uh, uh, do the thrombe uh, thrombectomy as early as possible? Uh, still, this, uh, uh, this area is not completely unanswered, but fortunately, there are a lot of trials going on in acute centers on this. Next one. Uh, we don't have somebody, if somebody has already had a stroke, and if they come after the uh, thrombolytic or thrombo thrombectomy windows, uh, unfortunately, we don't have any neuroprotective drugs. We have a lot, thousands of drugs which proved absolutely uh, amazing at uh, animal experiment level, but none of them translated into human trials still. Is it because animal models were bad or is it because uh, the technology, uh, the, uh, they didn't do any randomized control trials, so the methodology of stroke was bad? Uh, or because humans are very, very different from uh, other uh, animals, uh, we need to really uh, do some good research here too. I I'm sure there could be neuroprotective drugs uh, emerging if you do this properly. Next one. Next one, please. Um, so, uh, yeah. Now, uh, when we think of uh, physiotherapy, we all know that we are all happy to have physiotherapy to, uh, to give to patients physiotherapy, but how much it actually makes a difference? Uh, actual quantification of physiotherapy related uh, improvement uh, is not uh, clearly known. Uh, it doesn't do any harm. So uh, uh, it's all, all, always given actually, but we also should try to quanti uh, quantify so that at least between the different measures of physiotherapy, we can really uh, uh, find out which one is better compared to the other ones. Next one. Um, there are newer techniques, fancy techniques, uh, some may like to call it, like uh, uh, direct current stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, facilitation of the uh, affected side or inhibition of the unaffected side so that the affected side is stimulated to work by itself better. Uh, the, uh, there are a lot of research going on in this area, people using different types of protocols, uh, but uh, we are still, we are to, uh, we don't have uniform uh, protocols which has emerged as uh, a, a good working uh, models. 
to go into guidelines. So this in area we still do not know. A lot of uh, crack therapy is going on, people making money doing all these things. So we have to be guarded, but and we have to try to see whether this is effective or non-effective uh, actually. And if it is effective, uh, what, what are the best protocols? Next one. Uh, the, uh, we are uh, in India, we have a lot of traditional medicines and uh, many a time there's a huge divide between, uh, and there's always some fights also between the traditional uh, 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 physicians and the uh, uh, allopathic or modern medicine uh, 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 physicians. And uh, this has actually alienated the uh, medical scientists from exploring uh, deep into the uh, herbal medicines uh, like uh, Ayurveda or maybe uh, Unani or uh, uh, Siddha medicines. Uh, we need to scientifically test these drugs because huge amount of uh, money is being spent by people on the uh, other medic medical, uh, uh, other conventional medicines. Uh, they are costly also. Uh, and even government gives reimbursement. So how good they are? Are there any of them bad? Should we... Uh, take them out of the market, uh, it's difficult, but then there should be an attempt to do, uh, do this. Artemisinin came from Chinese herbal medicine. They tested it scientifically and they proved it. It is saving millions of malaria, pa malaria patients now. So we need to very urgently uh, look very carefully uh, uh, and very scientifically into many of these uh, tropical herbal drugs abandoned uh, in India. Next one. Uh, and we have traditional practice like yoga, meditation. Uh, everyone says it's good. I not seen a paper telling that these are all bad. Uh, so, uh, but uh, scientific evidences. If you look at the papers, scientific uh, quality is always questionable. Most of these papers that that doesn't mean that they are not uh, bad, but there is a need to very carefully evaluate, to quantify, and to find out which of these yoga practices. Uh, could help, which could actually endanger, uh, because there are some of the practices which produce a lot of hyperventilation, produce vasoconstriction, etc., to the brain potentially. So, are they really good? Uh, if so, so. What happened to Dr. Sunil? Has he. Is something problem with this? Uh, maybe. So, what shall we do? I think he lost his connectivity. So, so I think. Speaker is Dr. Sriram Vardarajan and he is consultant neuroimaging and stroke at Coimbatore and is also a stroke survivor. So I think we'll be able to hear something firsthand from him. Dr. Sriram Vardarajan. Good evening, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. And um, hope my fingers are audible. Uh, so um, the topic given to me was to speak on uh, something called a referral pathway. Uh, do we have a robust referral pathway available in India? And is there a continuous process that is there towards uh, providing the best outcomes towards to pay stroke patients? Uh, to be really honest, the answer is no. But I think it's, it's, uh, it's better that uh, we, we can go uh, on a positive note uh, to first understand the pathway available first and the need for a referral pathway, and what is this kind of cycle, life cycle approach towards stroke itself. Um, my affiliation is always um, not towards neurology or radiology. It's always towards stroke when it comes to discussion like this. And from my own personal experience um, over the last uh, maybe 15 years or so uh, since I've done my medical schooling. So can you have the next slide, please? So as we can see, the pathway starts um, with the patient coming to the hospital with the first onset of stroke, although this is not ideal, the pathway should begin with prevention, but invariably that is never the case. Uh, we always uh, realize it later that 
you know we had a lot of lifestyle factors that went wrong we just couldn't get time to spend time, uh, you know importance to our own bodies and stress levels these days are kind of increasing day by day so we eventually start off with a patient coming to us with stroke and that is kind of the hyperacute phase and all that we can do at that time is to ensure that the damage is as minimal as possible which means we just have to hope one the stroke is a minor stroke but if it is a major stroke what are the things available at our disposal disposal to reduce the extent or the severity of its impact because the initial onset can be severe but we have a time window albeit a very short and narrow window to reduce the damage so we have to rush the patient quickly to an imaging and then we have the treatment options broadly categorized these days as thrombolysis or thrombectomies which means either you dissolve the clot using a lytic drug or you go inside and remove the clot and we're talking about an ischemic stroke and unfortunately uh, science hasn't progressed so far in the hemorrhagic counterpart and all that we have at our disposal is quality nursing care uh, control of risk factors and hope that uh, you know we can rapidly reduce the amount of damage by reducing the amount of bleed so ischemic stroke is what the most of the focus lies on even in the previous discussions in terms of all those establishment of tele stroke uh, units trying to get government hospitals to provide thrombolysis the focus is out and out on the ischemic stroke which is kind of okay because it constitutes the majority of the stroke you're looking at maybe an 80 20 ratio and and the 20% that is hemorrhagic stroke and they start off as a step brother they already start off with probably not uh, being able to get the same outcome as an ischemic stroke the stroke unit is a very important concept and probably one of the best proven concept the earliest proven concept that creates a change in outcomes and we just hope that every city every district and every uh, even a village can in you know due course have a small stroke unit and and it doesn't take a lot we're talking about at max uh, maybe four bedded six bedded uh, without a need for a ventilator with just monitoring devices and then we move on to the specialized assessment and the most neglected part of it which is the post stroke therapy yes we we do the lysis we remove the clots but what about the majority who are not candidates for this acute therapy and i tell you at max the best of the best centers across the world they can hope for maybe a 20% thrombolysis rate and a 10% thrombectomy rate which means that we are not again catering to the remaining 80% of and and that is the sad situation and that's where the post stroke therapy plays a huge huge role that's where all the occupational therapists the speech therapists the physiotherapists the speech and language therapists all of them it's, it's a complete multidisciplinary team approach and it starts from the day the patient suffers a stroke we all know that a virtual reality augmented programs nowadays can even improve their outlook towards stroke recovery it can be done even when the patient is lying in the icu bed and 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 let's not make it very high fi every patient affords a smartphone these days they we're not talking about a, a, a high end device with providing a virtual reality system let's not even go there we are in india let's have a simple phone that is available there to be shown videos videos of what the patient wants to see not what the doctors want to show it should start with a patient's perspective and i will show that in the subsequent process how do we take the cycle and place the patients in the center of it and finally we discharge them majority of the times we say functional independence we use complicated scales we say mrs all that we want to know at the end of the day can he do his day to day life can he continue with his previous life how much are the restrictions and what are the things to be changed in his lifestyle and this has to be a continuum because the patient has to be told this is your expectations at 3 months these are your expectations at 6 months provided you fully cooperate with the rehabilitative process and how do we develop a system to ensure that this process happens at least to the most optimum levels and that's where most of the bottlenecks are and finally if all of them goes well and if the patient cooperates and most importantly if he has a supportive system the importance of family we saw that in the attend trial very very important trial conducted here in india and and you know family led rehabilitation unfortunately it wasn't positive doesn't mean we let go of it 
it is still probably our best methods to provide a better outcomes to majority of the stroke patients by teaching and training the caregivers the patients relatives because even now studies have shown some of or most of them tend to live in joint families it's not the case in big cities but we go down to tier 2s tier 3s the villages we know the local people are out there to help how do we use that india's greatest gift would be our manpower so how do we use this manpower in each of the settings across a continuum can we move on to the next slide so this again i've looked at what other countries have done and this is just to understand what they have done we can't keep catching up to the west it's high time we think ahead and look at showing the west what it has done our way and what works for us they don't have an ayurveda they don't have traditional medicines they don't have a joint family system i mean some of them do have but i'm saying the cultural practices that we follow in india are so vastly different and we follow a westernized pattern of medicine yes it is evidence based how are we going to apply that and how are we going to use it for the indian context and that is probably the most challenging aspect of it this is a very simple iconographic that i could find on the internet the steps in onwards have already dealt with the steps but this gives you a feeling of the magnitude of the problem we have this is not a single step problem we are talking about pre hospital notification we are talking about coming on time we are talking about reaching a correct hospital on time getting this imaging done on time and hopefully is a candidate for any of the lytic or the mechanical therapies and if not giving him the best possible stroke unit therapy with an assisted discharge plan if it sounds so exhaustive just to speak imagine to the patient what it means and and these are certain things that has to be made clear both to the patient if he is comprehensible and to the families at the doorstep of the hospital you're going to say this is a process because the common thing that we encounter here even here um sir can the patient be all right we are not fixing a mixer or grinder here you're talking about a human you're talking about organ systems you're talking about multi organ involvement if the stroke comes obviously maybe he has got risk factors that is going to also affect his heart his peripheral arteries maybe his eyes so we are going to talk about making the best possible outcome for him when he comes with a stroke and i please i would probably insist that it's better that he never suffers a stroke in the first place can we go on to the next slide yeah the next slide so this is again a system that is being followed uh, i could find on the internet in england this is uh, in the greater manchester city as we can see here they have concentrated on uh, incorporating the patient and caregiver groups and getting them into policy making and i think it's high time we start doing that we have moving in the right direction we have a national stroke association we have got a whole panel of stroke champions the strokeologists in our country okay but we need the champions from the patient group we need the champions from the support group we need the patient the, the champions from the rest of the departments not just the neurology we are going to look at internal medicine emergency medicine imaging we want to look at um, the rehabilitation team they form the fulcrum the core in which we ensure good outcomes let's not lose the forest for the tree we cannot keep focusing on lysis and therapy alone not just mechanical thrombectomy 80% is what we are looking at the rest of the picture you can see they just had a simple methods of four or five steps not much where they could integrate the networks so if you can see they started off as something called an scl or a strategic clinical network and they converted that into an occupational delivery network england system works because they have done something called centralization they have understood for their population and their kind of situation it's best if a patient goes to a certain hospitals depending on the area involved so they have got hallmarked some hospitals called the hyperacute stroke unit or the asus and they have a network of four or five asus in one place and and it's going to be that a stroke patient within a certain kilometer distance of that goes to this asu and they are even struggling to provide the thrombectomy services because the numbers required are so high they have a fixed rota for working indians work day in day out we don't even know the concept of 8 cross 5 so and and the man par imagine what we can do with that so they have just simplified it into prevention reorganization optimizing the ambulance and in india unfortunately let's look at the picture 
majority of them come in their own vehicles so how are we going to educate them certain times calling up an ambulance is quicker a ambulance gives a free path in the roads our people are now educated enough to make sure the road clears up obviously if it's going to be a high density traffic network it becomes a problem but it's not impossible they have done improvements to their inpatient care and finally to their community rehabilitation they have started with prevention and they have finished with rehabilitation and i would want us to focus on all the uh, all these simultaneously because otherwise we would be playing catch up we would just keep following one by one what they did we could even watch what they did what was the outcomes and then incorporate the final outcome derived metrics into our context and that would what i would encourage can we go on to the next slide please yeah and and this slide uh, unfortunately i mean i had animations i think when i gave the slides to them they have taken off the animations so these are two animations the ones that is on the background i actually talked about how a us based system is available they call it the allied health assistant which means you have an health assistant who is not exactly a doctor but he can be a bridge between the clinician how he works is they ensure that the rehabilitation is done in teleconsult with the expert so it's not possible for a stroncologist to go and visit the home of every patient but what can be ensured that we develop health assistance when an election comes you got volunteers when corona struck we had volunteers so why can't we have health assistance volunteering for work in every network in every district and every village and we can make use of the youth force that we have and and they all have phones and they can be trained and they can do the rehab and they can find if if it's going to be on track or if it's going to be certain new problems that have come up a simple blood sugar a pin prick is not something that is rocket science for them to learn so they can measure the sugar levels they can measure the bp it's it's very simple and the allied health assistant that the us system follows is something that what we follow as asha so we have to magnet magnetize that and and give them incentives for doing much better work in that the second picture in the background which is not seen unfortunately is a stroke or competency pathways which means everything that we initiate needs to be audited in india it's easy to start start something but it's very difficult to hold somebody accountable for it so we need to understand roles we need to understand profiles and we need to make that communication very clear you know start this hope thing here and if you are not reaching here fine why did we not reach here and it's not a blame game and another thing that we see often in our setup is whom can i blame for failures in research failure is a norm it's just a stepping stone for success so we have the previous speaker talking about stroke research and the lacuna in that but one of the most important thing we have to understand is to accept failures is to accept that this is a system we live in there are certain things that takes time to change it's not impossible but we need time to change it and the last figure on the right was about the models that are followed and practiced in the lower and middle income countries we have something called an hub and spoke model major hospital minor hospitals and are they equipped to treat with certain kind of patients we have the asha models we have the multidisciplinary team care we can all even have tele consultations between a, an hospital let's say in ludhiana and another hospital in asin i'm taking this example because it's already being done and and i was fortunate to work with the person who initiated a lot of epidemiological work in the last decade or so dr jayaraj pandey and and you can you can go through his works available and and he's probably there in every panel and trying to push forward this kind of hub and spoke models trying to get the peripheral hospitals equip them train their staff we don't need specialist everywhere we can train them to become specialist it's not that difficult so the second part of the diagram structure there is actually talking about the structure that we need the process that we need to follow and the outcomes we need to derive using these processes i won't delve too much into it uh, because of lack of time we can move on to the next slide so these are the dimensions this this is this is what we need to plan for the next 2 years 5 years 10 years it's not going to be a day or a month plan can you come to the next slide please yeah and finally we have all these systems of care which places the physician at the center when do we start placing the patients at the center and and we are not talking about you know uh, even a village person has aspirations he wants to go back to the field he wants to hold a shovel he wants to know whether he can work the field and then we have got the other extreme the google educated people 
they know everything that is there to learn about stroke treatment do they spend the same effort in prevention i am not so sure yeah but they do come to us they have aspirations so when a patient is lying in a stroke unit when a patient is lying in the icu what are we asking him are we even asking him what are his dreams what are his aspirations how realistic it is we don't want to sound pessimistic and we can have counseling sessions the psychosocial workers and we don't see that happening in our indian hospitals i go to singapore there they have a family led counseling session in a stroke unit so they have a separate counseling room so you have yes we do make our rounds we do go back and visit patients but why can't that be combined with a counseling session that takes both the patient's perspective the caregiver's perspective and a reasonable healthcare objectives over a respectable time frame an it person coming with you know difficulty in moving the hand he might still be acceptable to moving around in a wheelchair but he wants to use his hand or he wants to use a speech if he wants to use a dictaphone the question is are we focusing on the goals rather than focusing on making him right fully that is a very difficult challenge but getting his goals is probably a more reasonable and acceptable challenge and and that's this is the entire focus of this slide getting the patient and probably i should say the caregivers in the center can you move on to the next slide and what is the treatment burden this is actually very interesting i'm i just unfortunate that you know i'm not able to see what, what are the individual things that is out there uh, it's 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 actually a theory heavy slide probably the only theory heavy slide in my presentation but this is a very interesting article that i could found on plasmon and it's from a uk group they don't consider a burden of treatment as just medicines or even the rehab they take in the social aspect the mental aspects so it starts with what what does the patient make sense of all this how does he plan and care for this and what are going to be the steps in each one of that so how do how does the patient interact with the physician how does the patient interact with the rehabilitation person everything is a burden everything is a treatment you spend 2 minutes talking to the patient that is considered as a treatment it is a burden to the healthcare service and how are we going to estimate the cost of this and that is going to be the biggest problem we can cost estimate the drugs we have papers that say the average stroke unit stay is maybe around 5 to 10 days the average cost involved is maybe around 80000 over 6 months and these are very well researched papers but do they account for the mental aspect of it, the psychosocial aspect of it and and those are things that we need to start seriously looking at get feedback from the patient how was their um, perspective changed post stroke okay and what does that mean for the rest of the family uh, 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 maybe i am a father of two daughters a daughter sees the father as the hero of their lives and if the hero is becomes bedridden what is going to be their perspective how do we take accountability and how do we estimate the cost of these things into our framework of cost estimate so treatment burden and and that's what these slides deal with so i will not go into the individual thing but we need to understand the treatment burden is a continuum just like care is a continuum can you go on to the next slide please and these are the studies that i told that the hospital cost are actually being determined and 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 there are simple studies there are complex studies we have the systematic reviews and all of them point towards the same thing average hospital stay 5 to 10 days majority males i can bring a perspective into this why do males come is it because the females are neglected we are a patriarchal society so is that mean the stroke in females don't reach the hospitals how is that we have every study showing a 70 30 female um, male preponderance while the age group is 60 yes we know that menopause and other hormonal influences play a part but with the mean age or the median age being 60 every study shows a male preponderance so is it in india i am talking about indian studies and is it in india that you know females are neglected is is that a real issue we are not sure and and they have a totally different perspective a male needs to go to work if the female cannot work in the kitchen the entire family suffers and and we have seen instances where they tend to work with one hand continue cooking by the other hand is paralyzed we had even videos when corona came people you know working with oxygen masks on their face i would say that these are unique perspectives applicable only to india the gender bias and and the urban rural bias the, the divide in them that was spoken about previous so those are issues that are india specific and and we need to start focusing on them not following blindly what the western medicine and evidence says go on to the next slide
okay again this is the same it's it's just that over 6 months it's going to be 80000 but if it was a major stroke even an acute hospitalization is going to cost you the same the average thrombectomy cost is upwards of 2 or 3 lakhs why are in the stents being placed as emergency medicines why are they be you know not come under life saving drugs why aren't thrombolytic drugs being given free of cost in every state some states do give it so we are making progress and and we should continue making progress the thrombectomy devices should be brought under the ambit of life saving devices and they should probably have a ceiling or at least the government should provide packages we don't want private hospitals to refuse a thrombectomy for want of money for financial issues because by the time they reach the next hospital the time is gone it's, it's i wouldn't blame the private hospital also to be really honest you know and 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 the government is the onus lies on the government to ensure that we have a separate funding available for such patients and 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 the other downside being are a specialist available in every government hospital it is not the case so why aren't we having a government private public partnerships why isn't every state looking at models where they can send government patients to a thrombectomy center and back again and and, and the procedure is going to take 2 hours so let the staff stay with them come back to it again they can be trained whoever is interested in the government setup i i work in a private setup and 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 we would love to collaborate with the government people when i was in ludhiana the general hospital there didn't have a ct machine and and they had a tie up with cmc and and these are good initiatives these are very very you know prospective uh, procedures on things that are more progressive next slide i'll be finishing this last couple of slides here. yeah so this is couple because i there are things inside this so who in 2018 brought this initiative and and it's called the patient centered or a people centered healthcare services approach and 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 they are focus on two things something called uh, you know a continuum and you know coordination a care continuum and care coordination and i think that is most suitable to stroke services and 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 that can only be possible by bringing all these stakeholders creating a vision creating a target plan over short term medium term and long term getting all the champions not just from one sector from every sector including patients and then daring to transform the situation we don't have to follow the west we can show them what is possible and i would end with that thank you so much thank you very much dr vardharajan uh, you have touched so many aspects like uh, what are the things that we can uh, we can take to our indian scene the models and other things like when to start therapy and so on so our final speaker is mr samir bhide he is an author and he is also a bcom graduate from mumbai he has done his masters degree from usa and he is also uh, worked at boston and also at vienna he is a uh, spent his 24 years in different roles in management technology consulting knowledge management and sales at various places in india and abroad he is also a stroke survivor and he is going to talk about his experiences and what can be done for the patients with, who have parkinson's disease sorry who have stroke mr sir thanks dr bihari for the kind introduction and thanks to support uh, alliance stroke support alliance for giving me this opportunity to be on this panel i'll try to go as fast as possible to catch up on time but i i will make sure i talk about the point i, I want to stress so productivity post stroke right is very very important uh, to heal because this is a trauma this is a big trauma for anybody so getting back to where you were or at least some part of it is very important and it's just not for you to be able to do some of the physical activities but also for your mental and emotional well being so it and it's very important for your independence a uh, very important not to feel guilty that you are dependent on someone so productivity is very important and before i uh, talk about uh, how support groups help i just wanted to stress that you know uh, support group is one of the tools we have to help us heal you obviously have to do a lot of other things as well so whether it's a traditional uh, therapy methods like physical therapy occupational therapy 
you know, speech or language therapy, cognitive rehab therapy, and stuff like that. You got to do that. As well as you have to experiment doing alternative uh, treatments and therapies. Uh, you know, yoga, meditation, you know, uh, Ayurvedic diet, uh, massages, uh, and music therapy, which I found to be very, very useful. You know, in, in India, you know, I've done rehab with Raga therapy. And over here in the US, uh, I'm doing something called whole tones, which is a high frequency music therapy. So it, it helps uh, with your brain. And it's not, not, not just the Indian, you know, uh, treatment and therapy. There are also lots of other holistic treatments uh, like acupuncture and etc. And the last part is you have to take care of your mental and emotional health as well. So not just, uh, you know, doing uh, traditional physical therapy and alternative therapies. You got to uh, do things like, you know, talking to a clinical psychologist. I think somebody mentioned that before. It's very, very important to do that. And I never did that before my stroke and I uh, did that after my stroke and it has helped me a lot. And the other thing uh, like music, which is healing is, is writing or journaling. And, uh, you know, it helps to put uh, your thoughts on paper. It helps to, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, talk about, you know, write about it, whether it's, uh, you know, in my case, it was a book, uh, whether it's a blog, whether it's just your diary or a journal, whatever writing is, definitely a healing healing method and the other thing is volunteering you know uh, what has helped me and uh, what will help you is volunteering your time to do other things right so like i'm uh, volunteering at a few places i volunteer at the hospital where i had my surgery and things like like that so that helps you with the mental and emotional uh, uh, you know peace that you you you're making a difference so lastly uh, right Joining a support group like the Stroke Support Alliance is exactly uh, you know what one needs, and and it helps you with mental and emotional support. And obviously, you're promoting uh, you know uh, you're raising awareness. Uh, uh, you know you know like we are raising awareness about stroke in in Stroke Support Alliance. But more importantly, you know you are sharing your experiences and practices with others, which have worked for you. And then hopefully that will be helpful to others. And at the same time, you know, you get information from others who are in the same boat, whether caregivers or uh, stroke survivors and what work for them. So it, it gives you, you know, possibilities. I, you know, I call it discover possibilities. In business, we call it art of the possible. And a stro uh, stroke support uh, alliance and groups, uh, support groups like that are a safe place where you are not judged you know, you are accepted the way you are. It helps you accept your new normal because post-stroke is an absolute new normal, no matter what kind of stroke or what you have. It's a new normal and joining a support group helps you, uh, you know, accept this new normal further. And you can, uh, you know, you can see others who are, you know, doing well and, and the fact that they have a life after a stroke and that gives you a lot of encouragement. And the other thing which uh, I, I find, uh, you know, support groups useful is, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's good to get things off your chest. So there are certain things you cannot ask others or whatever, but I think the support uh, groups gives you a forum to ask those things. And you don't feel, uh, you know, odd uh, asking questions, you know, so support group, uh, support group is like a family. You know, you, you, you feel the belongingness, you know, it's like a community and it's, it's like a family type community because uh, post stroke recovery is very, very lonely. You are cut off from work, friends and activities. So this feeling uh, of uh, belongingness is, is very important and Stroke Support Alliance, I'm very thankful uh, that I'm part of it. And I feel uh, the group is uh, like a family, like a community. So let me just talk about what support groups are not. You know, it's important to know what support groups are. It's important to know what support groups are not. You know, they are not substitute for professional care. So you may hear different ideas and things, but always remember uh, that they are not a substitute for trying out things on your own or 
you you still have to see your doctors and and your care pro, care providers and so on and also they don't have any magic pills there's no magic formula they have that will take care of your situation you know it it gives you ideas it gives you experiences and you have to try it out with, with professional care and the other thing which a support group is not it is not a place to complain or bash others or other thinking and stuff like that it's a place to learn uh it's a place to learn uh, you know from others share your experiences and so on and so forth it's not a place to complain and the other thing which is important for everybody to remember including me that it is not forever right stroke support groups are formed to help you face and overcome your challenges post stroke so at some point it has to stop right uh, and uh and and that, that's that's an important uh, element because I, i i know some people who are part of support groups forever and that's that's not the idea and again the other thing is it's not a place for everybody to jump in and and talk and have their opinions it's not a free for all it needs a good facilitator facilitator or a moderator like we are lucky to have tamanna in our group and again it's not a place only to talk and opine you know like we do on social media it's a place to listen you know listening to others offering encouragement you know offering motivation and stuff stuff like that and the last thing is uh when you're part of a support group don't uh, you know they're not they're not there to compare your situation with others you know you, you will heal uh, your way and at your time uh, so it's not a place to compare so so dr bihari those those were the points i wanted to make sure about support groups thank you very much your ideas are really very nice and very interesting and they are quite uh, one can uh, you know equate and feel with the ideas that you have right thanks for having me thank you thank you very much so just want to sum up the what whatever we have had heard over the last hour or so or maybe little more than an hour this uh, session has been very very interesting we had four speakers in this session and we understand the need of education education of masses education of people who are not yet affected and education of also people who are affected by stroke then uh, that is and the education starts from prevention and not from treatment or after treatment after the stroke has happened it starts from prevention also then we need to have technologies who can prepare useful and uh, affordable instruments which can be used like prosthesis and robotic arms and robotic legs so that people are able to move around for those who were, who were not able to move and there is also a paucity of personnel in different areas of uh, which need uh, to be provided to the person who has a stroke these these could be physiotherapist education uh, occupation therapist speech therapist psychiatrist physiatrist uh, psychologist language experts those who can teach music and those who can teach dancing also i think both of these activities are very helpful as you pointed out very nicely that speech helps i also found speech is very very useful when especially your speech becomes disprosodic there's no no tune no uh, sort of melody in your voice you need uh, to learn some language uh, some music like ragas which will help you to speak better and we also should go back to the traditional medicines like acupressure acupuncture are medicines which are herbs and are uh, other ayurveda and uh, yoga meditation and so on and there's lot of things to learn from uh, new research that can be done and uh, it's that of course will help in the patient care later but it helps understanding the disease and how to treat the disease as well and certain points which are raised by dr sri ram were very important like he said the 
for any management of patient with stroke, the patient is the center of the of all the inputs which comes to the we should move towards the patient and we should always keep the patient and the family at center and we are at a privileged position that we have a joint family system generally in uh, not speaking in large cities but generally in second and third tier cities in in villages uh, joint families are, are the norm so the the uh, education of the caregiver is also very important another thing which i want to highlight here is that the architects and the, but there should be a person who should inspect the house of the person who has had a stroke to see what all changes needs to be done for example how the bathroom should be how the kitchen should be how the corri uh, the corridor inside the house should be how what the furniture should be like which, some patient have difficulty in getting up from low chair so we need to modify the sitting chairs the sofas the bed may be also such a way that it's easier for the patient to roll out of the bed and then be able to mobilize so there's so many things that we need to address especially we are look, if you are looking at the good uh, outcome in a patient with stroke stroke is not just a, a thrombectomy or operation or remover of the uh, Uh, thrombus from the arteries there are so many aspects of it and very nicely highlighted by all our speakers so with this i will like to thank uh, dr ratna all our panelists all our speakers and also the people who are attending this and who and the uh, stroke uh, uh, alliance stroke therapy alliance whatever is it known as and the organization with which uh, ratma is attached which is uh, uh, dakshayam dakshayani so i'd like to thank all of you thank you very much thank you thank you ma'am uh, this panel was really fantastic thank you so much we did receive a few questions but uh, in the interest of time we will send the questions to the panelists and we hope to receive your answers so thank you so much once again and uh, with that we move to the next section of uh, today's discussion um, and i would like to invite uh, our last keynote speaker dr sanjeev kumar um dr sanjeev is a chairman and managing trustee of three domain health leadership foundation and he's also the chairperson of the indian alliance of patient groups he is the past executive director of national health systems resource center ministry of health and family welfare government of india and uh, all india institute of medical alumni of all india institute of medical sciences new delhi uh, he is also chairperson indian academy of public health chairperson institutional review board at gautam buddh university and he is a professor of leadership global health and program management at england institute of global health new delhi he has worked for 22 years as a health specialist in unicef and various uh, international assignments he is a preventive and social medicine specialist and uh, lectures in university college of uh, medical sciences new delhi has more than 100 papers to his uh, credit in scientific and popular mag uh, magazines and chapters in books thank you sir for joining us over to you for uh, wrapping up the entire discussion since morning which is not going to be an easy task but i know you will do it with elan so thank you so much for joining us and the floor is yours thank you thank you ratna for that generous introduction and i also thank your other team members tamanna ankit dabra and many others who are behind the scene you have been on it for more than a month getting hold of each one of the experts so excellent job done you had gathered 14 experts including the chair each one of them renowned not just in india but globally so my task is very difficult because what they spoke each word they spoke was pearls of wisdom and knowledge so my task is to try and bring that together i will do my best to bring it together uh, but i will start with nothing for us without us that was one thing which came out very clearly and in my summarizing across five broad areas i will highlight that point because as chair of indian alliance of patient groups i won't do justice to my job if i don't do that the first area i want to talk about is problem and its pathway 
the problem of stroke in last couple of decades has in, gone up from the 12th cause of death in india to fourth cause of death and it will keep increasing it all, already contributes to about 2 million deaths every year and about 11 million hospitalization every year in india it is already a huge problem which is increasing by the day and if you don't look at the whole pathway which starts with people who are healthy they don't even have risk factors you have to prevent risk factors in them then you have people with risk factors who are more likely to get stroke you prevent stroke in them by taking care of the risk factors they already have. Then, of course, we have talked a lot about the people who have stroke. What can be done? So, uh, and what can you do to prevent? Healthy dietary intake, maintain good weight, physical activity, control of blood, blood pressure, and control of blood sugar prevent smoking and drinking and stress which is increasing by the day i even hear two i even hear uh, two three year old children talking about stress so uh, that is going down to even children and everyone in the society what we have to do is detect early and prevent early and that is when we can handle so that was point one which is the problem and the pathway which starts with keeping those who are healthy healthy second is operational guidelines we have uh, the guidelines which many of the speakers refer to uh, developed in 2019 and i am told a revised version is available is going to be available in 2021 the globally renowned institutions such as WHO and National Institute of Health and Care Excellence of UK and many others have developed a clear methodology of how treatment guidelines, operational guidelines can be developed. In 2017, Ministry of Health developed this what is known as method book unfortunately this was not followed in 2019 and i am not sure what was the fate in 20 in uh, 2021 which we will see now you have experts very renowned experts and some of them were on the panel but only out of 16 experts neurologists rehabilitation experts and government officials these global guidelines clearly state you have to include patients you have to include bodies representing patients you have to include caregivers you have to include nurses because they are the ones who are providing most of the care in the hospital no doctor just gives a prescription but it is the nurses who look after stroke patient family members they are giving care in the hospital if allowed and they will continue to give care to these patients at home. They were not included. Primary healthcare physicians were not included. Everybody talked about starting stroke care from ASHA upwards. But why any one of them was not included in the development of guidelines? So that is on operational guidelines which uh, we are following. Excellent guidelines. Another thing which many of the speakers refer to, whatever you include in the guidelines has to be evidence-based. As per ministry guidelines on developing guidelines, you have to give strength of evidence. They call it power of evidence. Do we have a strong evidence to promote an intervention? Is it plus minus awaiting for more evidence to come through so that you can either include it in future or remove it from the treatment in future so that evidence-based guidelines are very important for us to uh, develop this was the second on guideline the third one is on hospital clinical level interventions 
the speakers have talked about golden hour getting the patient to the hospital as early as possible who is the one who notices the symptoms early patient and family member nobody has to, they started with asha she is not in the family the first person to pick up any signs which could be suggestive of stroke is the family member so they need to be the one who need to be educated and they will take the patient they will look for transport and then take uh, the patient maybe uh, contact asha if she is available and take her help to take them to the hospital many of them talked about bridging the gap or minding the gap between patient and intervention patient and doctor i would go a step further minding the gap between patient and intervention because there are three types of delays when we look at emergency care one delay is taking a decision to go to the hospital if they are not available uh, aware in the family what could be stroke they will not take a decision early enough to start moving the patient to the hospital second is transportation quickly taking them to the hospital and preferably in an ambulance so that any life saving measure need could be done in the ambulance as the patient is being done third even after reaching the hospital i have uh, been to all india institute of medical sciences as a student as a post graduate student and also uh, as an attendant of a patient it is a huge crowd in the opd or in the emergency it is very difficult to for you to walk up to a doctor to get his attention so it is not enough to get the person to the hospital it is also important that after reaching the hospital in the minimum possible time the intervention is is started in the clinical care we heard a lot about innovations we heard about telemedicine tele stroke tele radiology uh, palliative care we heard about educating and preparing the family there are many good examples i heard first time about good palliative care in kerala 15 years back when i was in geneva but why it has not been scaled up with the whole country 15 years is a long time so you have good practices innovation but they are not being scaled up why anybody outside kerala does not have access to good palliative care and i look at other innovation so we need to look at scaling up the good practices and innovation getting people who are doing this to meetings like this to discussions like this is good but somebody has to be held accountable for not scaling it up in the whole country and that that is what is lacking in india i think one of the speakers said that we have good programs we have good in uh, uh, strategies and we have uh, good interventions identified in uh, protocol but it is not being practiced last beneficiary is not getting it the fourth fourth one is population level intervention care of stroke starts at home and ends at home those who survive come back home so we have to keep the family in the focus because that is where the care will be taken before the patient gets to hospital to get the patient there in time and after the patient comes back home it is the family and i wonder why people talk about patient centric care now i am reminded of mahatma gandhi's quotation i will not quote the whole thing we are in healthcare system because of the patients not the other way around we are not doing a favor to the patient he is doing a favor to us by giving us opportunity to serve i heard many speakers say a uh, patient should cooperate his life is at stake the family has lot more at stake and we are saying the patient should cooperate i think the healthcare providers should understand the patient need and cooperate so that you can provide good care which we can call is patient centric the fifth and the last uh, point i would say is financing you look at financial allocation against what the government decided to allocate we are not looking at the best 
allocation in the world. We are looking at what government of India decided. In 2002 national health policy, they decided that they will spend more than 2% of the GDP on health care. When we were writing the next health policy, which was released in 2017, we were only at 1.1%. Now it has got a bit better. It is around 1.3% of the GDP. But 2017 national health policy says 2.5% of GDP will be spent on health the next year. 2022 is coming. And where are we? Around 1.3%. You have to have a big pie so that the allocation for conditions like stroke can be bigger piece of that pie. So that needs to be advocated very strongly with the government counterparts so that we get sufficient allocation. And of that pie, what is being spent on uh, non-communicable diseases? I don't have figures for stroke. Till a couple of years back when uh, I looked at the data, it is only 3% of expenditure on health, which is spent on NCDs, including stroke, including diabetes, including cardiovascular diseases <clears throat> and cancer, only 3%. The government needs to give it a higher priority so that you can have more allocation and the pie gets bigger. Every one of these priority conditions can get bigger share of that pie. Insurance coverage is the last part of this financial allocation. There should not be a limit. I have seen personally in my friends and family who were hospitalized. One fine day, the doctor comes and says, you are being discharged today. And then when you go to the finance section of the hospital, they say, you have reached the limit. You have reached the limit of insurance for this condition. They won't get any more money. I think both private and public uh, social insurance need to look at the condition and the treatment for conditions rather, rather than putting the limit. The first question they ask when you go to a private hospital, which insurance? And they immediately know how much money they can uh, uh, get from this person who is insured by a private or even by Ayushman Bharat. And that needs to be done to end. I will repeat what our, our friend from WHO said, unite. I will change the sequence. I will bring integrate second, third, educate. Educate is very important because it is the patient and the family who will take care in stroke or prevention of stroke. Fourth is treat. And we have excellent guidelines. We need to have resources for treating them. Fifth is fund. Without fund, money makes the mayor go. Without fund, you cannot improve care of stroke patient. Thank you so much. Over to you, Ratna. It was a difficult task. I hope I was able to capture most of the points. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Excellent summing up. You you made my job so easy. Now I don't have to do anything except call Kamana and ask her to give her word of thanks. So thank you so much. And we can get input from the speakers when we uh, draft this because we have yes. may have missed some important points. Thank you so much. Most, most, certainly, most certainly. Thank you so much. Tamana, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ratna. As, as in the beginning, it was addressed by Dr. Ratna about the scholarship. So we are almost here to announce the names who have won the scholarship uh, from the Stroke Support Alliance. So first is Ms. Akansha Sharma. Second is Mr. Arvind Chitor. Third is the, um, just one second. Yeah, third is the Bhavesh Thakur. And fourth is Mr. Mohan Kumar. So we congratulate to all the four winners who have literally won their scholarships. Thanks, uh, I congratulate to them. And now on the behalf of the Stroke Support Alliance and Dakshma Health, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the speakers who have joined us today for the panel discussions and keynote addresses. It was a great pleasure to listen to your presentation and learn so much from it. Your presence and wisdom helped us increase the visibility of our cause. The rich discussions will, uh, will be captured in a report and disseminated to all for the further comments. 
I would like to also express my gratitude towards the organizers, Dakshma Health, Indian Stroke Association and Stroke Support Alliance, our collaborators, Healthy India Alliance, Indian Alliance of Patient Groups, International Alliance of Patient Organization, Patient Academy for Innovation and Research, and Mumbai Stroke Society, and especially our sponsors, BI, for their continuous support in making this event successful. I would also like to appreciate our stroke survivors and caregivers who have been constant motivation to us and have helped us with the numerous insights and experiences to shape the event to its current format. And I thank especially to all the participants who have joined us today. And I hope you have enjoyed this, these, these discussions. Now, we would now like to close the session and thank you and stay safe. मेरा नाम गीता है मेरा नाम जितेंद्र वार्षणी है मेरा नाम शरद कुमार है मेरा नाम कामरान है मेरा नाम आशीष है मेरा नाम वरुण है और मैं एक स्ट्रोक सर्वाइवर हूँ मैं एक स्ट्रोक वॉरियर हूँ मैं एक स्ट्रोक वॉरियर हूँ और मैं एक स्ट्रोक वॉरियर हूँ और मैं एक स्ट्रोक वॉरियर हूँ और मैं स्ट्रोक वॉरियर हूँ बी का अर्थ है संतुलन क्या किसी व्यक्ति को अपना संतुलन में कठिनाई हो रही है ई का अर्थ होता है आंखें अर्थात किसी व्यक्ति को अगर देखने में परेशानी है उसकी भूमि दृष्टि हो रही है या देखने में कुछ भी देखने में असमर्थ है एफ का अर्थ है चेहरा क्या चेहरा नीचे की ओर खींचा जा रहा है मुस्कान टेढ़ी है और मुंह में भोजन नहीं रख पा रहे हैं। ए का अर्थ है हाथ हाथ या पैर में अचानक कमजोरी महसूस होने के कारण रोगी चीजों को उठाने में असमर्थ है चलने या खड़े होने में असमर्थ है एस का अर्थ है क्या व्यक्ति के भाषण को समझना मुश्किल क्या बोलने में कठिनाई आ रही है टी का अर्थ है समय यदि आप इनमें से कोई भी लक्षण देखते हैं तो अपने निकट के स्टोक के लिए तैयार अस्पताल पहुंचे सुनहरे चार घंटों के भीतर और अधिकतम छह घंटे तक लक्षणों को पहचाने और स्ट्रोक को रोकें। अपने लक्षणों को पहचाने और अपने स्ट्रोक को रोकें। लक्षणों को बचाने स्ट्रोक को रोकें। लक्षणों को पहचाने और स्ट्रोक को रोके अक्ष दो पहचाने और स्ट्रोक को रोको लक्षणों को पहचाने और स्ट्रोक को रोकें। 